don't have a hill internship? Not working 80 hours a week and feeling guilty? Feeling like the world's going to end because of a few bad grades? Don't have your entire life figured out? Neither do we, and we're seniors. Hi, I'm Jenny. And I'm Danya. In this podcast series, we'll be talking about all these questions and more to understand why AU is the way that it is and if there's anything that we, as in you and us, can do about it. This podcast is a three-part series released by AU Center for Diversity and Inclusion, or CDI. Today, we'll be sitting down with Professor Decor and Professor Naomi and Chavdege de Jesus, two professors at AU, to understand the faculty perspective on grind culture and burnout. So we encourage you to put away whatever you're working on, relax, even take a walk as you tune in. Great. Um, well, Dr. DeCure, could you please introduce yourself for our listeners? Yes. Um, I thought about this. I know that on AU's campus, people usually begin by introducing themselves with their job title and where they work. So I thought of a different way I wanted to introduce myself for this space. I want to introduce myself as an anti-racist educator. I want to introduce myself as someone who tries to use every classroom opportunity to advance anti-racism in what I'm teaching and how I'm teaching. Now at AU, I teach in the School of Education. I teach a number of different classes to undergraduates and graduates. I work with the Center for Teaching, Research and Learning. I'm an inclusive pedagogy fellow and I'm a researcher. So I conduct research in the space of education. That's how I'd like to be introduced today. Thank you for that uh, wonderful introduction, Dr. Decor. Um, it, I think it really speaks to um, you as an individual. And I'm really excited to hear your response for our next question, which is how have you seen grind culture and uh, burnout amongst your students? Yeah, so um, unfortunately, I feel as if I don't have to look very far. I feel that grind culture, the feeling of being burned out is very present. Um, Yes, more so in COVID, but even before COVID, this was a very strong reality. Um, one, I see it in the commitments that students have with the campus, their academic commitments, their schedule, the number of units that they're taking. I mean, in, in distance learning, it's how many Zoom classes you stack back to back on your calendar. Um, the rigor of the classes, the number of internships that AU students feel they need to have. I feel that many students feel that they are burning their energy with their campus commitments. And you can see physical manifestations of this, um, that students feel and are sleepy, fatigued, have stomach aches, um, and have a greater sense of exhaustion and being overwhelmed by all of these campus commitments that they are managing. But I also know with some students I've taught over the years who have um, left lasting impacts on me as an educator, that many students on campus hold a great deal of off-campus commitments that contribute to this feeling of burnout. Um, students who are having to work for minimum wage and carry 20 hours or sometimes more than 20 hours of part-time work. Students who have their own family commitments, either children that they're raising, being part of marriages or committed relationships, or caring for their own parents or siblings at the same time of being a student. Um, and I think that we often neglect to recognize the intensity that some of these off-campus relationships may have on students, um, but it definitely can contribute to a sense of burnout when students feel their campus life does not 
make visible their off-campus life and that they have to work so hard in two different spaces and neither space sees that the other space exists. When they often don't see the other off-campus commitments that others are having, this stereotype threat begins to cause them to feel as if they have to be a certain way, do a certain thing um, in order to keep up. And it can create a sense of external pressure that contributes to the sense of burnout. Thank you for that, Professor. I feel like that was the primer on the faculty perspective, and that was exactly what we were looking for. And just the way that you phrased that so well-roundedly speaks to just how burnout is not just one thing. It's all of these things that we're seeing together work together to create this issue. And I wanted to ask you next how your teaching style has changed or adapted to accommodate student well-being? No, that's a, that's a great question. It has changed. Um, most recently because of COVID and having to transition teaching practices to an online platform. Um, what I would be excited to share with you and with your audience, I just had an article published last week in a magazine called Inside Higher Ed where I wrote an article called 10 Habits to Humanize Your Online Classroom. And the purpose of that article is to offer teaching strategies that can support students, particularly at this time. And many of those strategies can help to um, disrupt the cycle of burnout that many students are experiencing. Um, so I'll, I'll send you this in the chat. I'll make sure that you have access to the article because students can not just read it, but can also share it with the professors that, they, um, that they're taking classes with to be able to start a conversation on how the student is experiencing the class and how maybe there's something from the article that could be brought into the classroom space in order to make it more student-centered and student-oriented for success. So one, before the pandemic, I had been checking in on students daily at the start of every class, asking students to share how they're experiencing their lives. But even in distance learning, I am retaining that practice. I find it very important for us to build a class community and that comes by knowing one another, both our joys and our pains. Um, and I participate in that check-in by making myself and my own humanity visible to my students. I want them to see the things in my life that bring me joy. And I want to talk openly about joy and talk openly about my professional success because I want students to see that you can be successful and make space in your life for joy. You can be successful and make space in your life for family and friends and things that are important. And success does not need to be a replication of burnout culture as you progress further in your life. Um, I also think in my classroom, I have tried to be intentional with making my assessments meet the needs of students as learners. Um, one attribute of an anti-racist educator is to make policies visible in class. So an example of that is a policy for asking for extensions on papers. Many students don't know how to ask for an extension. They don't even know that they are allowed to ask for an extension or some flexibility in the rules that are indicated on a syllabus. But I teach my students how to ask me for an extension, um, when to ask, what information to provide, and the response that I will give them when they ask me for an extension. That practice helps to disrupt the, break, uh, the burnout um, cycle because it lets students know when you are feeling overworked, when you are feeling exhausted, there is a way that you can bring some flexibility in your academic life. And then lastly, I would say one way that I'm trying to change my teaching is to make sure that students are engaged in the class at every class space. Um, this is not an opportunity for me to simply lecture 
or pour information into students as passive receptive vessels uh, uh, waiting for me to pour knowledge into them, but using the class to have real conversations about how we're understanding the material so that every day students have a new opportunity to engage. Because we're in a burnout culture, um, there's some days that some students are ready to engage and some days they're just not because of other things going on. But if we make our classroom a space where every day is a new opportunity, every day there's a new set of uh, spaces and, and doors open to participate, then students know that they can come as they are on that particular day, even if it's not the same consistent engagement for the following day. Just being aware that there's so much else going on in their lives besides just my one class. Yeah, thank you for sharing um, all of those wonderful like, tips and ideas um, and being able to reflect on how you feel implemented those practices in your classroom. I know, obviously, as someone who's getting ready to graduate, I've spent a lot of time reflecting in the past few weeks on, you know, my education and my four years at AU. Um, and I think it's frustrating a little to sort of remember and feel how sometimes I had professors who really did not put forth as much effort um, to create a space where I felt like, yeah, they understand that like, I'm not a perfect human being or that like, you know, I need breaks as well. Um, and so I feel like that's something that I really want to see more of at AU um, because for the people who come after me, I don't want them to go through those experiences of feeling so tired and burnt out. Before we end Professor DeCure, I wanted to ask if you had any last thoughts that you would like to share or further elaborate on that you feel is important to this discussion, or if you have any advice that you would like to share with our listeners. So I have advice, all right. Um, my own undergraduate years were at Cal Berkeley, um, go Bears. And Cal Berkeley is a highly competitive campus, very rigorous academically. So it's very similar to AU in that way. Um, and it had back then, all the way back in the 20th century, <laughs> and it still has now a very strong commitment to pro promoting social justice, right? Protest movements began on Berkeley's campus. Um, so as a student there, I learned how to surround myself with friends and my family and selected faculty and staff members who affirmed my humanity, all right? These were people on campus that I could study with, but I could also laugh with. And that is so important and was important to me then because I put myself, <clears throat> excuse me, I put myself with people who would support my whole self not just one aspect of me as a student or one aspect of me as completing an internship. Um, so my one advice would be, no matter what is happening on campus, surround yourself with people who affirm your full and complete humanity. And then the second advice is to be present in the moment. Um, so I celebrate every life stage that I'm in every academic moment that I have for the joy that comes with that moment. And it allows me to prioritize what I wanna prioritize in my life, which would be advancing issues of social justice or advancing issues of anti-racism. So I have goals. I don't wanna say I don't have goals. I have goals in my life. I have priorities in my life, but I don't push through my current stage in order to get to the goal, right? You enjoy the moment that you're in for the time that it presents itself in your life. And I've told my students on the first day of class, whenever I'm introducing myself at a new semester to a new class, I talk about the different jobs that I've had over my career. When I first graduated from college, I never thought I wanted to work as a faculty member at a university, never. It was never my wildest dreams, but Everything that I experienced, I enjoyed at that moment and paid attention to the next opportunity that would come and then moved into that with that joy and intensity, uh, intentionality for that particular moment. So be present. Don't just allow the burnout and the grind culture to make you think that what you're experiencing now 
is always to prepare you for what's next to come. What you're experiencing now is beautiful and joyful and can be empowering for what it is now in your life. It's not always the prerequisite for what comes next. So those would be my two advices for students who, you know, can't change the whole campus environment, but they can at least change how they exist and function within it. Um, but we're just going to start off by having you, um, if you can introduce yourself uh, for our listeners. Sure. Uh, my name is Noemi Chautegui de Jesus. I teach in the Department of Psychology at AU. And um, I teach courses in psychology, but I also teach courses that are part of the AU core, like complex problems. And in complex problems, I teach about immigration. And uh, for the core, I also have uh, started teaching AUX2 this semester. And I do other things, you know, in AU as everybody, there's a lot of different hats that we wear, but uh, in terms of teaching, those are my main uh, areas. Excellent, thank you so much, Professor Noemi. Um, for our second question, we wanted to ask you if you could explain what imposter syndrome is and share your thoughts on it with us. What I have heard about imposter syndrome, um, is how it is this, um, these feelings or these thoughts that we may have um, in an institution, an academic institution or in the workplace where we feel um, doubt about whether we belong there. Uh, this feeling that we may be a fraud even uh, in that space. Um, that somehow we may not have. So that would involve doubting that you have what it takes, right, to be there. Whereas others do have it. That's some assumption that you're making that others have what it takes, but you don't. And somehow you are still here and you don't know how you made it, right? That, that kind of thinking is what's been called imposter syndrome. But that kind of thinking has been attached to people that have been underrepresented in those spaces, right? So uh, people of color in, in academia or uh, in professions uh, where you are not in a majority, like women in certain work environments or women of color in a specific work environments in which they are not uh, typically found, right, or expected. And so that's the typical definition, right? This idea that we doubt ourselves and we think we're, we're not supposed to be there. And somebody will probably figure it out that we were not supposed to be there. Um, so that's the definition. But then what I was going to say about it is that we need to question that, like, where is that coming from? And why would we feel that way? Uh, and what are the conditions that have led to that way of thinking, or even the, the label, like the idea of a syndrome. So, so every, as everything, right, we need to question and figure out where is that coming from. Yeah, I think that was a really great explanation. Um, and as our follow-up question to that, what do you think are those negative effects of like continuing to perpetuate the idea of imposter syndrome, especially for students at AU? Um, so it's, it's interesting because I, I, I have thought about that sometimes, right, for myself, from others, uh, for students, sometimes students bring it up uh, themselves. Um, so, so I have some different tracks of thinking around it. One is, first, that we definitely have to, to take a step and back and say, where, where did it come from, right? Um, so normally if we are part of those underrepresented groups and we're starting to doubt ourselves and lack um, a sense of confidence that we definitely belong here and I have what it takes to be here. Um, if we let the negativity, the doubt, the doubts uh, seep in, it will erode our confidence eventually. It's like those self-fulfilling prophecies, right? And so, that is what is not helpful. Like 
assuming that this is this is true, I, I, I feel that way, and then letting that seep in, uh, that could in fact erode our confidence, confidence that you need precisely when you are needing to do your best and, and show your best. Um, other people sometimes what that does, this, this doubting, is going to a gear that they are doing so much more than they are supposed to do. It's now I have to prove myself and, and they can burn themselves out, right? That it's too much, that they're trying too hard um, because there's that doubt that I don't think I did enough. I don't think that was my best. Uh, so that I have to show them. So it could have negative repercussions, right? If we keep uh, thinking that way. Another thing that I've heard some people complain about is the word syndrome itself. When we say syndrome sounds like a disease or it's, 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 a, it's an illness. And um, it puts this blame on us, right? Like we are ill. Uh, so what do you do to cure yourself of this thing? And so think differently or whatever. But um, it doesn't take into account what have been the reasons outside of this person that this has happened, that you have had to come to think like that. Oftentimes it is because you are indeed underrepresented in that space. And that is not your doing. That is because we have had uh, multiple uh, practices, oppressive practices that have relegated people to the margins and they are not being of, they haven't been part of that space. And so you have reason to be concerned that we shouldn't be in a society in which you are one of a few, um, but you have achieved and we are so proud that you have achieved that you're able to be uh, in that space. And so um, I think it, we need to always question like, why is it that this happens? And it happens because we have um, a society in which many of us haven't been provided opportunities or allowed to pursue opportunities to be more represented. If we were more represented, we wouldn't feel that we are one of a few and uh, feel like an imposter. Absolutely. Um, you spoke to some really excellent points on the flaws of calling it a syndrome and narrowing it down to the individual when it's our oppressive structures that have enabled this to go on for so long. And our next question is actually, if you have confronted imposter syndrome or burnout in your academic career and any steps that you took to take charge and confront these. Yes, that's an excellent question because it is right. right? So we, as being part of this groups, right, that are not uh, typically expected in these spaces. Um, we may feel that way, like, oh my God. And it may not be that we feel we don't have what it takes, but because we are only one of so many, we feel, oh my gosh, uh, would I succeed? Would I be able to do what needs to be done here? In a, part of it is the Sometimes, I don't know if you both have thought of this, how you feel you, what you do is also connected to your family, to your loved ones. It's like you are representing so many other people by being there. Um, so there's so much writing on it, right? So much writing on this. Um, so yes, I have had those kinds of thoughts. Like, it, and it's a combination of that intersectionality of social class, of race or culture, ethnicity, all those things like, wow, I'm here, so I made it this far. It's, uh, you, 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 you pat yourself on the back, but at the same time, you, you wonder, should I, should I keep going, should I try? Um, so yes, I felt that in different places, um, at different times in my academic career, or my professional career, uh, in the classroom, uh, when, even when I was in Puerto Rico, and that's where I went to college, because then there's the class issue, right? It's not just ethnicity and race, but also class. Um, and so you, you notice that you were not privy to certain 
spaces uh, as you were growing up and now you discover that, oh, they have done all these things and I never tried or was able to, to uh, partake in those experiences. And then graduate school, similar things. But so yes, you, so you question that, you wonder, um, but you keep going because you know there are other role models, which was really helpful to me to see that, to see those role models, uh, to have mentors that really take that away from you. Like somehow the mentors can see through that and tell you that's not uh, something you have to worry about, right? Like there's no imposter uh, here to be worried about. We didn't use that terminology when we, I was, uh, um, talking to my mentors or at the time, but now that I know about this terminology, I know that that's the kind of feelings that I might have been having, these doubts. Um, and then eventually the burnout, as you was describing, also can come. It could come from what I was saying earlier, that people may try to prove themselves or prove to others that they definitely belong, that they do too much and can burn out because of that. Uh, but burnout can come from other other reasons, and so it could be sometimes that you're not feeling that sense of um, reward or of um, connection, right, belonging, and that could also give people a sense of burnout. So what I've done about it, one, as I said, is the idea of remembering my role models, remembering um, you know, what mentors have told me and, and have helped me see. And uh, with burnout is finding the pieces that really motivate me and say to me, this is why you're here. Uh, and I mentioned family earlier, that's for me one way in which I can get out of that kind of rut, right? Of that kind of uh, negativity of burnout by thinking um, how important it is for me to do this work because it means something, not just for me, but for my family as well. Um, for me, it motivates me to, to think of um, the students I work with and how, um, just like I was saying earlier, I had role models, then I had to think to pass it forward. So I would have other students who may have um, they see in me that, you know, there is another person there that may be like me or looks like me. And so all of that helps to get out of that burnout feeling, right? Or space. Yeah, well, I can definitely speak from personal experience that you have been a role model for me. And I'm really grateful oh, that, you know, I, you. I got to meet you, Professor Naomi, um, you know, pretty early on in my, my college years, um, because there are so many things that I definitely missed out on. Um, I didn't really get to find until I was, you know, well into junior, senior year, but, you know, I got really lucky meeting you as a sophomore. Um, so I definitely agree with, you know, having a role model is really important and just having that representation. Um, obviously, representation can't be the only solution, but I think it certainly helps when you have, you know, professionals and faculty who know exactly how you feel. And then I also just wanted to highlight what you were saying about sort of that pressure to show up for your family. I think that that's something that is very specific to, um, you know, students of color, but also just students generally who come from other marginalized identities. Um, and so I think that's just a really important thing to like highlight um, in the podcast. But as sort of our final question wrap up, um, are there any sort of last thoughts that you wanted to share or elaborate on that you think are important to this discussion? And then if you have any advice that you would want to share to our listeners. I guess it's hard, right, to talk about burnout um, because I could say, as many of my colleagues probably have been telling uh, their students, there are so many other things you can be doing. You don't have to, to, to keep go, 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 or, or um, have like those three internships per semester, you know, things like that. Um, because students will want to try. They want to keep trying these different things. But I hope that we can still convey the message that you have to balance, right? You have to balance the wanting to do all those things and figure out why are we doing all those things? Um, 
Is it because they really will improve your, your prospects for your career? What do you want to learn? What do you want to get out of these years in college? Um, so hopefully that's why people are doing that uh, because it helps them grow uh, as, as people. Um, on the other hand, there are people who want to try to do so much, so much more and they can't when it comes to those internships because we have so many systemic barriers that impede people from engaging on those experiences. And so instead they have to do a lot of other work that is paid work and they cannot engage in those internships. Um, so I would say whatever you are able to do, it's because it really will bring a growth to what you want as a student, as a person, uh, that it has meaning, right? That these things have meaning uh, to you in one way or the other. And as you do all that, always have that connection to people. So it could be, we were saying role models, it could be mentors, family, family you create, the family you have, but the people that are gonna be meaning, meaningful to you, significant to you, I feel that uh, those are going to be some, some critical connections that we need to, to keep that sense of wellness of uh, uh, of centering, right? Because that doubt from this imposter syndrome issue or that burnout, we need to um, heal from that in some way. And so those connections. With, with and there you have it. Part of the faculty perspective on AU's grind culture and burnout and how they've addressed both. We want to thank Dr. Decor and, the prof and Professor Naomi and Chavege de Jesus for sharing their experiences. And we hope you've either learned something or recognize that it's not just you going through it. Next time, we'll be talking about how we can take action against these feelings and also on ideas of radical self-care. This is Danya. And this is Jenny signing off from CDI Peer Educator, Educator Radio for today.